na najave naših govornika na zadnjem panelu. Dakle, kao što ste mogli vidjeti iz programa, na redu je prvo Liljana Burcar, predaje anglistiku na Filozofskom fakultetu u Ljubljani. Kao što se vidi iz naslova i ovog predavanja, poslije socijalizma, samo demokratski mrak prevladava, nametanje kapitalizma i prisredni povratak uloge domaćice. Dakle, vidi se da je tu feministička perspektiva ipak prisutna, tako da ćemo na taj način donekle, nadam se, kompenzirati ovaj neoprostivi deficit feminizma na ovome na ovoj manifestaciji. Nažalost, nam je mnogo pozvanih kolegica i drugarica morala odkazati različnih razloga, ali eto imamo bar Liljenu da iskupi nas i obrani čast. Ok. So, I have been asked to give this paper in English, which is something I'm not particularly fond of. Štačivom, tako je. So, um, uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, uh, put down some uh, basic ground, so to say, as to uh, uh, what this free patriarchy organization is, and then I'm going to proceed to the core of the argument. So, obviously... <laughs> then I have to shout. So, over the course of the last 20 years, uh, former socialist states uh, have been subjected to intense processes of repatriarchalization. Repatriarchalization or redomestification of women refers to the structural processes, not just any kind of processes, but structural processes uh, which push women back in the isolation of their homes as uh, economic semi dependence or complete dependence and uh, more and more and now around the Knockout paid service and child care providers. Now, as such, of course, uh, women are uh, come to make basic economic and social rights, which also undercuts their agency autonomy power, reducing them at best to another category of secondary citizens. Now, repatriarchalization is a direct consequence of the orchestrated destruction of socialism and the forceful neo-colonial imposition of capitalist social relations. Contrary to the common belief promoted by ever so liberal democracies, patriarchy is not incidental to uh, capitalism, nor is it merely just a separate and parallel system that supposedly only runs alongside capitalism, intersecting with it only occasionally. In fact, and rather, institutionalized patriarchy, so once again, not any kind of patriarchy, but institutionalized patriarchy, is capitalism's mainstay. So, just like racism, for example, it is one of its key structural features. This is the kind of knowledge and understanding that uh, we should have never allowed ourselves to forget, and also the connected memory we should have never allowed ourselves to erase. Uh, yet we did, and uh, considering what was said here yesterday and the kind of questions that were asked, uh, I also restructured my paper so that, first of all, I would like to uh, recuperate some of this historical context for better understanding of what is happening today in terms of repatriarchalization. So, first of all, we have, we have to remember that it was industrial capitalism uh, that reinvented and consolidated patriarchy to its own advantage, putting in place new patriarchal structures and ideologies. In other words, it was industrial capitalism that introduced the institution of the nuclear patriarchal family, the breadwinner mo model and thereby one-to-one -one economic dependency of women on men, and also the doctrine of two separate spheres, the so-called private and public domains. Now, as we all know, this resulted in the splitting of socio-economic space into two seemingly separate, or what were interpreted as separate, but in reality, dependent, intersectional and much more, in fact, unified spheres of so-called productive and reproductive labour. These two spheres and categories of work were not only artificially split from each other on the basis of the constructs of masculinity and femininity, but also hierarchically reorganised and therefore differentially valorised according to the newly instituted gender division of labour. At this point, I would like to say that reproductive uh, work is considered as unproductive, which of course is ideology par excellence. Why so? This is an artificial split once again. Reproductive work is also a source of value creation. The end product is a human being. 
so we are talking about social reproduction. So the notion of a pro um, productive sphere and a reproductive sphere, this is an artificial split because what is going on in the circle of reproductive sphere, sphere is also productive work, so to say. It does not necessarily result in uh, commodities, objects, but it results in different kinds of entities uh, that are literally made and produced, so to say. Now, men as a newly created, um, I really have to explain this context so that we can better understand uh, why repatriarchalization also means the implementation of highly conservative ideologies in terms of constructs of masculinity and femininity. So, um, men as a newly created category of either wage workers or capital owners were allocated to the field of so called productive labour, which is very narrowly defined. And women, on the other hand, were excluded from it and consigned to the newly established separate sphere of reproductive labour on the basis of newly instituted constructs of masculinity and femininity. So what were these? Uh, women, in, and this goes back to the quarrel about women already uh, underway but, uh, uh, very well in the 16th uh, century and it was transposed then uh, onto the 17th and 18th centuries and uh, through Marx and to Rousseau and also it ended up in uh, the uh, justification of the division of uh, newly reorganized space into public and private spheres. So, in this process uh, of reconfined constructs of masculinity and femininity, women were denied the attributes of reason and rationality, thereby also the ability of abstract thinking, which became the exclusive preserve of men. I'm really uh, <coughs> summarizing the surface, so to say, I'm su uh, summarizing the uh, philosophy that informed this division and why was it that uh, women's confinement to the so called private sphere uh, was uh, justified and how it was justified. So it was justified on the basis of these constructs. Another thing was that men were not only defined as rational individuals, which put them in charge of the public sphere, they were also reconstructed as being bodily non specific and according to this illogical logic capable of conquering and transcending the restraints of bodily existence. So this in turn was used to confer upon them the status of universal, disembodied and in no way restricted entities. Women on the other hand were denied rationality so that they could be re rendered different and instrumentalized. So whilst they were rendered particular so that they could be treated as an aberration from the norm, women were equipped with intuition instead of reason, they were reduced to the body and marked by very narrowly restructured and reworked sexuality. So this was done for the purpose of bringing them in close realignment with nature and thus out of the public sphere of political agency and economic independence. So these were all constructs on the basis of which uh, the division uh, between <coughs> public and private was uh, legitimized and also naturalized. So it was on the basis of these discursive maneuvers and reconstructions that women's consignment to the newly established private sphere and unpaid reproductive work was legitimized and naturalized. So once women were reunited with nature and confined to social reproductive work within the seemingly isolated privacy of their homes, they enforced child and elder care and imposed duties of household maintenance and nurturing obligations could be easily redefined as not proper and has not really productive work that is the kind of work that does not need to be paid or ruminated, all on the basis of the constructs of masculinity and femininity. Now, this is also of crucial importance for the understanding of capitalism and its forms of capital accumulation through the creation of non-waged and highly exploited fee caring and domestic labour of women. Social reproductive work is of essential importance, as we very well know, for the production of future neighbour force and maintenance of the current one. Yet by redefining it as a matter of private concern and caring burden associated solely and entirely with women, and by declaring it to be not a proper socio-economic activity, but merely an extension of women's supposedly feminine nature, whatever that is, and has the kind of work that is by necessity done out of now and for free, Capital owners avoid social responsibility and financial costs that go along with, with it for the maintenance and reproduction of humanity and their labour force in general. In other words, by transferring the costs of social reproduction to women on the basis of constructs of femininity, capital owners avoid huge financial costs associated with the reproduction and maintenance of their own future labour force, which of course translates into a direct increase in their own private wealth. That's my Excuse me, can you go a little bit slower? It's kind of hard to follow. Um, a little bit slower. Oh, I Thank see. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm rushing through. Uh, all of this uh, because of the time limit, but uh, thank you. <laughs>
No, but it's really interesting, so it's a pity that you miss it. Uh, well, it's really basic, so, um, so it, is for, <laughs> uh, it is for this reason that capital owners in either workforce do not recognise women's assigned task of production and reproduction of the worker as a socio-economic activity, but mystify it instead as a personal service extended on the part of women as part and parcel of their supposedly naturally occurring and repetition, uh, repetitious work to be conducted solely at home. So once again, by transferring these huge costs entirely onto a specifically designated group of people, in this case women, uh, whose work is posited, structured as endless free resource, capital owners subsist on the free reproductive labour consigned to this specifically uh, categorised group of people and draw huge profits from the wageless condition of women's labour. It is for this reason that in capitalist patriarchy, women are constituted merely as dependent wives and reproductive mothers. At best, they are constituted as working housewives. So, if I put it now into more complex Marxist terms, so domestication and construction of women in capitalist patriarchy as primarily free caregiving housewives and dependent mothers represents the basis of surplus labour extraction. Once again, we have to keep this in mind, this is very important, it's a formula that runs through all of these constructs of masculinity and femininity in patriarchal capitalism. It exonerates capital owners from financial costs and social responsibility associated with the reproduction of their labour force. And thirdly, at the same time, once they are consigned to the role of primary, primarily dependent wives and many reproductive mothers, women in the capitalist system are regarded as dependents and constituted as secondary <coughs> citizens and secondary workers. This means that once they are by necessity partially readmitted to the paid labour market, women's pay and work is conceptually restructured so that it comes to be regarded not as equal and complementary, to that of the male member of the household, but merely as supportive and supplementary to it. So not equal, but supportive, not complementary, but supplementary. So this is done regardless of the actual partnership or marital status of the, of the woman and regardless of the fact whether her partner is employed or not. It's the ideology. That's the way it works. So this systematic devaluation and invisibilization of women's work in the capitalist system, which rests on their construction as primarily dependent housewives and mothers, who at best can also work outside home as secondary earners, is a trick by which 50% of human labour has been defined as a free resource. So capitalism thus rests on patriarchal subordination and gendered exploitation of women, they impose unpaid reproductive and underpaid productive work is central to its processes of capital accumulation by what we might call gendered dispossession. Now, I'm skipping. Uh, socialism, of course, um, brought about a new identity, possibilities of self realization and attitude to women. It dismantled the institution of the breadwinner model and thereby private patriarchy, that is one-to-one -one economic dependency of a woman or man, uh, which also, um, it did so by granting women the entitlement to full-time employment on a permanent basis, out of which women, unlike their Western counterparts, could for the first time derive important individual-based social rights, such as access to social benefits and social security, full health, <coughs> health and pension insurance coverage, fully paid maternal and parental leave with accompanying child benefits and a guarantee of re-employment in the same job position as prior to their maternity leave. Now this is something that, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, that uh, uh, women in the West could only dream about. So, um, and socialism managed to do this of course by socializing the costs of reproduction. Child care and elderly <coughs> care and thereby the social reproduction of humanity became a matter of shared public responsibility and state subsidized policies. So socially states erected an extensive structural framework. What? They can't see those two small uh, slides. Like I thought it was, it was a set the right. Page. It was right this to the right page. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. the first one. Yeah, that was good. Okay, so um, now, um, 
So socialist states erected an extensive structural framework to support the emancipation of women, and this was reconnected in the extensive network of affordable public childcare and many other facilities and benefits. Now, why am I showing you this? Because this, of course, stood in stark contrast, and still does, to the so-called Western democracies, which after the Second World War, of course, far from doing away with the breadwinner model, have simply modified it. So in this way, they have kept the socio-economic structures of gendered expectation, women's systematic subordination and second-class citizenship very much intact. So what happened? Capitalist states um, built on the family policies that actively encouraged women to leave their employment completely, which is a strategy applicable to the rich. And of course, the rich are adequately subsidized. For example, they would be given uh, tax breaks, and these tax breaks would actually go to the, uh, to the breadwinner, to the family earner, if the woman stays at home. But who can afford to do this? Only those, of course, who can afford to have one parent jobless, so to say. And just to give you a piece of information, for example, um, Australian uh, research institutions report that because this benefit is only means tested on the second earner's income, who is in fact unemployed, for example, over 30,000 uh, families on incomes in excess of 100,000 Australian dollars per annum received the benefit in 2002. These families do not need these benefits to start with in the first place. So this also gives you an idea of this, uh, the model of the Western state, which works primarily in favour of the selected segments of the upper and middle class. But uh, this is something uh, that is highly complex, and I'm just mentioning it so on the surface, so to say. So capitalist states. Um, or, uh, so either they leave the employment completely or uh, they encourage to interrupt employment for the period of up to three or even five to eight years and then seek part-time jobs, jobs or combine employment with child uh, in order to combine employment with child care. So this is all due to the absence of or a very limited and sporadic availability of public child care facilities. So Western states have thus upgraded the traditional breadwinner model to the so-called more or less one and a half breadwinner model, with the woman only precariously and intermittently employed in temporary or part-time jobs supplementing the income of the male household member. Um, now, um, in contrast to socialist states, full-time employment and hence socio-economic independence has been the preserve of only a handful of women in the West, just to give you a piece of information. So, uh, if we take Germany prior to the unification, the statistics show that only 44% of married women in the West Germany were employed, out of which only half were employed full-time, which amounts to only 22% of all the women in West Germany. And um, um, so this uh, is also highly comparable to another thing, namely, in Western democracies, childcare needs are still not covered in Malta, Cyprus, the Netherlands, uh, Ireland, Portugal, Switzerland, Spain, Greece, and the United Kingdom. In Italy, parental leave, for example, uh, in Italy, for example, parental leave analysis is known as 30% of the woman's net wage. Uh, the five-month maternity leave analysis accounts for 80%, and so on. So why does this matter? Maternity and paternity leaves, of course, are uh, also go towards the maintenance of uh, actually. So the, it's a part of the reproduction. By cutting uh, these maternity needs, of course, this means that capital owners can simply accumulate uh, more capital by transferring the social costs onto women themselves. If maternity needs are not paid, of course, that means, uh, it stands to reason, a lesser of uh, the expenditures, perhaps no taxes for capital owners. This is the point. So it's not just the child care facilities, but maternity leave and paternal leave just as well. All of these elements combined together. Now, how much more time do I have? Um, Never mind. <laughs> so, um, Five minutes less. Pardon? Five minutes less. <laughs> so, Fifteen. Now, Fifteen. 50, oh, enough? good. Um, yes, fair. Okay. Now, so we have finally, this is the basics covered. Now we would like to move on to the current situation. So. This so-called transition from socialism to capitalism, of course, is a euphemism for regression. Uh, as we well know, it stands for a massive scaling back of essential socio-economic rights, which affects women differently from men. 
So the reinstallment of capitalist social relations rests on the processes of repatriation organization, which is most clearly evident in the dismantling of the socialist welfare system, its extensive network of public child care facilities. So social benefits, including maternal and parental leaves for women, have been drastically reduced or restructured to minimize or do away completely with the financial input that would otherwise be required on the part of recently fledged capital owners. So substantial reduction or elimination of fully paid maternity and paternal leave works in favour of capital owners, as I have just explained, as it helps to keep the taxes, for example, on corporate profits at the minimum. This contributes to the greater accumulation of private capital bid to that of corporate entities or small business enterprises. Now, maternal paternal leave analysis have been either substantially snatched so that in some cases they amount to only 40% of individuals' average earnings, or they have been reduced to the level of sick leave compensation categorically and ideologically aligning pregnancy with disease. In some post-socialist states, such as Poland, they have been simply annulled for the majority of women, uh, especially middle-class women, which puts the Polish women in the same predicament as those in Ireland, the United, Sw uh, the United States, Switzerland, Greece and the Netherlands. Um, at the same time, the period of parental leave for women has been extended up to three or six years of the child's age, of the child's age as public child care facilities have been either entirely eliminated for children up to three years old, most, uh, this is a pattern most prevalent in uh, most regions of Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, or drastically reduced in number and only partially replaced by sporadic private care facilities that of course charge exorbitant prices and remain out of reach for the majority of women and men. So protracted periods of unpaid or no paid parental leave and a complete lack of or only limited provision of publicly funded child care has a double negative impact on women's socio-economic and political status. Now, uh, as capitalist regimes, which are based on the privatization of care, place the child care responsibilities squarely on women's shoulders, they also effectively force women to exit neighbor markets to tend for children, while perversely presenting this move as their own choice. Look at this uh, argumentation made on the part of the Czech finance minister, Knaus, uh, who criticised the uh, over-employment of women and said um, the Ministry of Labour and Social Affairs is preparing a programme for young women so that they can afford to stay home with small children and we will aid them so kindly with uh, social support. This policy in the end will save money because when women work they need state-supported care. When women work, but not when men work. Look at this division, first of all. So, um, basically, so these structural changes enforce and naturalize the position of women as economically dependent partners and carers. Um, these child care regimes, which are marked by lack of publicly available and affordable facilities and by extended per, uh, parental leave policies, they force women into specifically pre precarious forms of work, giving rise to the feminization of poverty. So this is part and parcel of the repatriation And it is in this way that nowadays, here, too, women's paid work is restructured as secondary. Well, their income is being reconceived as mainly supportive and supplementary to be spent on basic daily food provisions and other elementary household goods. So the most prevalent type of uh, um, women-friendly neighbour inclusion, uh, are, which is promoted nowadays as part-time work and, and home-based wage, uh, wage work. Croatia, for example, uh, introduced part-time work for mothers in 2004. This is the information I came across. And just Two weeks ago on the news, I heard this piece of report which said, well, the ministry is going to take care of women's better integration into the labour market as mothers, so what we recommend is that they should pursue part-time jobs and they should actually pursue home-based work just as well, which is, a, uh, which is declared to be a women's friendly policy, but basically it's a form of discrimination and exclusion, of course. So what is the problem with these part-time jobs? Um, so part-time jobs are a phenom phenomenon specifically targeted at women in capitalism after the Second World War and represent one of the earliest forms of unprotected, flexibilized work, which is highly profitable, of course, for capital owners. Why? Part-time workers are exempt from the neighbour laws that pertain to full-time employment. Uh, they are consequently subject to little or no job protection, poor work safety and employment standards, as well as depressed or below minimum wage compensations. 
There are many other things just as well, but uh, perhaps uh, we don't have enough time to go through this. So I would just like to point out that uh, part-time jobs do not include or severely limit workers' eligibility to work-based social security uh, benefits, which is also mostly clear, most clearly reflected in reduced or non-existent health, pension and unemployment scheme coverage for these workers. They work long and irregular hours, usually with no fixed daytime schedule, and in addition to these being unstable and low-paid part-time jobs, they are also dead-end jobs. So they do not uh, they need no place for further skill development, transport training, job advancement. And in this way, they effectively cement women's newly assigned status of devalued secondary workers in the formal sector of the capitalist economy, primarily in the service sector. So part-timers are thus constructed as an extremely cheap and devalued neighbour pool, which alongside the restructuration of childcare regimes serves to compound women's economic and social marginalisation, inevitably resulting in the feminization of poverty. Another type of course is home-waged work, the second form of precarious work, which is targeted specifically at women and uh, introduce um, so women who work at home uh, they are structurally forced to incorporate full-time childcare, housework and possibly elder care into their working schedule. They are treated as self-employed, of course, but in reality they do not earn their capital and labour. They are dependent wage subcontract workers <coughs> to whom labour-intensive parts of production are farmed out by intermediaries or big companies themselves. So, home-based uh, waged work nowadays includes both industrial home-based work, primarily for textile and apparel industries, the leather and shoe industries, electronics, toys, sports goods, and service home-based work, such as data processing and clerical work done by a home computer. Now, home workers represent the most exploited and the least protected category of labour. They are usually paid at least 40% less for the same kind of work performed by their counterparts in the formal sector of the economy. They are not paid at an hourly rate, but of course on a piece rate basis. That is, they are paid by the number of finished items they make, which translates into a very low pay that falls below, below a minimum wage. And this is further exacerbated by the fact that minimum quotas are deliberately set so high that it is impossible <coughs> to meet them without working well beyond the regular working time which of course remains unpaid. But at the same time, home workers have to buy and maintain the machinery to keep the production going. Without any compensation paid on the part of the employer, or they have to borrow the machinery from their contractors in exchange for monthly service charge, as for example pizza order takers who must rent computers and modems from the employer. This is where microcredits come in. Microcredits targets its women come in at this point. So uh, once, um, uh, when it comes to, you know, to, to this, uh, the idea is that uh, once women are, are <coughs> in fact uh, let go, for example, from big companies, uh, this was the case with Mura, so the textile factory, once they were let go as regular workers, they were uh, required to go into some self-employment training programs and possibly also take out microloans on the basis of which they would uh, simply buy their own startup machinery uh, that's indirectly subsidizing uh, their uh, future employers. Now, the third mode of precarious work and gendered exploitation introduced by capitalism in this area that relegates women to the status of endlessly available source of free social reproducers and dependent, marginalized, and underpaid workers concerns the integration and subsumption into the so-called family businesses. These are increasingly male-headed and based on gender division of labor. Women are expected to combine the assigned full-time childcare and domestic work with unpaid or partially paid but highly invisible employment in their partners' firms. Within these arrangements, women's care work is not seen as proper work as it is not seen when it comes to home-based work because home-based work is considered to be just an extension of their full-time domestic and childcare work done in their homes to supplement the family income. So, um, the, um, the, they conduct, uh, it's the kind of work they conduct for their partners' firms. Uh, this is usually of administrative nature or might in other supportive tasks which are only minimally illuminated, while most of the profits, once again, are handled and kept by the husbands as employers. Now, 
This goes true even in the case when women set up seemingly independent businesses through microloans, the point of which, according to the World Bank, should be to generate enough money to supplement the feminine income while directly helping to prop up the partner's enterprise and helping to replenish his labor potential. Let's look how this is coded in the, in the World Bank's discourse. So, as we can see, women and girls uh, should be given microloans because they work harder than men, this is the stereotype, are more likely to invest their earnings in their children, are major producers as well as consumers, and shoulder critical, life-sustaining responsibilities, which are privatised, without which men and boys could not survive, much less enjoy high levels of productivity. So you see the supportive element. They are there to support and supplement rather than actually be independent earners, uh, so economically self-sufficient, of course, dependent. Uh, independent. So this new entrepreneurial discourse targeted at women as a form of self-help and economic sufficiency is a way of getting women off the unemployment benefits and primarily into the unprotected informal sector of the economy, where they end up working once again as subcontracted, home-based and therefore dependent wage workers. Women, women's seemingly empowered role of micro-entrepreneurs is in fact subsumed under the rubric of domestic and invisible productive work women should perform as a category of secondary and supportive workers. The work of women is thus once again recast as exclusively nurturing, directed at other family members and contributing to the autonomy <coughs> and independence of male workers, even if, even if it is extended into and conducted in the so-called productive sphere. So the point of women's productive work as independent entrepreneurs under the micro lending schemes is to make up for the loss of social provisions and earn enough money to buy basic goods and resources that before the marketization were either held in common or subsidized by the state. So micro lending schemes does both rely on and intensify gendered norms of social reproduction. Now this reprivatization, so these are various schemes which have a common denominator. This is reprivatization of maternity and childcare, which pushes women back to the newly refurbished private sphere, limiting their socioeconomic status and agency, and thus also restricting the possibilities of their self perception, self determination, self realization. So, with the destruction of socialist state and reintroduction of capitalism, we are also witnessing a new phenomenon an increasing inequality among women themselves. It is only rich mothers in top positions who can secure full-time employment, but only by outsourcing domestic and care tasks through the so-called caregiving markets, which have, however, only partly replaced extensive networks of public and affordable childcare facilities. In the face of the dismantled public care facilities and social provisions, the integration of women into top positions in West industrial societies thus proceeds primarily on the basis of a broadening of informal feminine working conditions in the home economy. Uh, for, for example, uh, if we excuse me, uh, if we take a look, these are the, uh, the EU directives, and if we take a look at the, se at the second paragraph, the one in the middle you will see that uh, the directive is the development and upgrading of child mining jobs in institutional structures, day nurseries, day hospitals should be encouraged, but not so much because the development of private, private or firm-based day nurseries must be encouraged more. However, we can encourage another thing, which is child mining jobs in the home, mother's helpers, day mother's home helps. They would supplement community mining and reception facilities. In other words, these are measures that are directed at women in the top positions. So, basically, we're talking about the hiring either of migrant neighbor, migrant child carers, or actually uh, uh, absorbing, uh, absorbing um, recently um, dismissed women from the public sector and rechanneling them into these uh, private, uh, private uh, households. So. The households of the newly rich and their children's welfare are being sustained by an army of underpaid, devalued, skilled women for less than a livable wage in precarious working and unprotected conditions of the informal sector. And this is also the policy officially pursued by capitalist states, which in the process of downloading the costs of and labor social reproduction onto households, have undertaken 
The measures in the form of legislation bills, disciplinary practices, and coercive and discrimination neighbor laws. To help the rich in obtaining a continuing supply of a cheapened and valuable domestic source of neighbor, so either in the form of unprotected immigrant or impoverished local women workers who are being etched out of, of the formal economy into the unprotected informal sector. But despite all these restructurations that have hit women hardest, our states here have been adept at churning out images of women's limitless opportunities of employment and fulfilling our identities and these possibilities of success and empowerment, <coughs> providing women should only try hard enough. Part-time and home-based employment policies aimed at women are touted by state agencies and their, and their corporate donors as women-friendly policies that enable women to reconcile their full-time household and childcare tasks with paid employment supposedly granting women choice and a form of economic and social empowerment. And this is taken over by the newspaper discourse just as well, who have come to promote part-time jobs as an adequate solution. Sorry. And uh, for example, they would say, uh, this is taken from Jutrani, uh, well I'm going to say it in school, Jutrani, well, Jutrani list. Uh, which I came across uh, during my holiday and I was uh, never gasped to see something that written as a form of a recommendation and actually as a form of a woman-friendly policy. <coughs> so uh, the newspaper article carried the news that, well, well, in Germany it is 70% of women who work part-time. So this equation is still a rarity, but sh it should become something of a common sense in order to alleviate the problem, supposedly. So the problem in alleviation is not equal distribution of childcare between the two partners and of course socialization of childcare and other services because this would take away private capital so to say. No, it is actually repatriarchalization which is framed as an equality policy. So perhaps I should finish on this now because now I'm absolutely furious. <laughs> <laughs> that happens with you tell me. <laughs> okay. So um, perhaps just this. So um, once again, we have to remember the point of these women-friendly policies, in inverted commas, is to exonerate capital owners from the social responsibility and huge financial costs necessary for the reproduction and maintenance of their current and future generations of labour force, which leads to a huge accumulation of private capital by the so-called gender dispossession. The point of these policies is to preserve all these equality policies in liberal democracies is to preserve the status quo, leaving capitalist patriarchal structures and modes of capital, capitalist expectation intact. Women-friendly policies and capitalism are, interestingly, not dubbed uh, so much. Social e e equality policies for this shift from merely formal to substantive rights would require, as we well know, a new revolution. So what is in reality called for in place of women-friendly policies that help to maintain the status quo then is a concrete redefinition of socio-economic structures for it is these structural conditions that ultimately also determine women's position and role in society. So we are not, when we talk about patriarchy, we do not talk about personal, face-to-face, -face, seemingly decontextualized, individualized oppressions. We are talking about a system of exploitation and nothing more. So, I will finish on this highly infuriating note. <laughs>